thank you very much and welcome. Yes. Um, so this is a joint work with Edouard Bonnet, Yaroslav Neschetril, Patrice Osona de Mondes, and Stefan Tomasi. And it will be about twin widths and permutation. And as you say, it's uh, about this new width measure and the connection with logic, with encoding this new uh, measure in, in different structures. Let me put this into the bigger context before I start going into the details of twin widths. So you are most likely quite familiar with the notions of clique widths and tree widths. Um, so these are, are very widely used and uh, great width measures for, for undirected graphs. Um, what we do here is we recursively decom decompose the graphs um, along low order separations. Yeah, and for, for tree widths or branch widths, uh, we do it with respect to vertex connectivity. Um, it's a very important width measure in graph theory. I will not go into further details. Um, clique widths um, is a similar recursive decomposition. Now with respect to a different uh, connectivity function with respect to cut rank. Yeah, so we can take the concept and we um, of this tree decomposability and we just plug in different connectivity functions and we get those tree-like decompositions um, where tree width is for sparse graphs and clique width is for dense graphs. Um, and clique width is often seen as a dense analog of, of tree width. And in fact, we have a characterization of the graphs of bounded tree width among the graphs of bounded clique width. Yeah, so a graph uh, class C has bounded tree width if and only if it has bounded clique width and exclude uh, some bi clique. So this means some complete. Uh, graph KTT with T vertices uh, on the sides. Yeah, so this, this can really be understood as a sparse version. The tree widths can be understood as a sparse uh, version of this. Now, we can characterize uh, multiple such classes or identify those that exclude the bi um, among the dense graph. So we have this characterization of tree widths bounded tree widths graphs among the graphs of bounded clique widths. We can also characterize the graphs of bounded path widths um, inside the graphs of bounded linear clique widths. Yeah? So again, we have this phenomenon. If we have a class of bounded linear clique widths and exclude some bi clique, then we get something of bounded path widths and they are exactly characterized by this. And there is a third measure, um, graphs of bounded tree depth are the sparse analog of graphs of bounded shrub depth. Now, what could be dense analogs of other graph classes that we are looking at? For example, let us look at planar graphs. Yeah, so one possibility is to look at map graphs. Map graphs are defined as the intersection graphs of uh, connected and internally disjoint regions in the Euclidean plane. So in this representation, you see it here on the, on the bottom left. Um, we have those regions, and then we put a vertex for every region. These are the blue vertices here, and then we connect the two vertices um, when the regions touch. Yeah? So this includes the planar graphs, but they are more general. And in particular, uh, the map graphs can be very dense, yes, because many regions uh, can touch at a corner, so we get arbitrary large cliques here. Now we can also take a different representation of map graphs as half squares of planar bipartite graphs. So if you look at the bottom right um, in the figure above, you see the blue vertices. And then for the intersection points, um, I have made a red vertex. Um, and then we want to connect two blue vertices yeah, there, there is a connection point. If they are connected by a path of length two, why are one of those red vertices? So this is a special case of a logical transduction, yeah, getting something dense from a sparse graph, from the planar bipartite graph here with, with blue and red vertices. What we are doing, we are constructing a graph G from another graph H. Yeah, and we are to do this construction, we are first coloring the vertices, we are distinguishing here between the blue and the red. 
And then we define a new edge relation from what is there in our graph H. Yeah, so our graph H is this bipartite colored graph now. It is enriched with the colors. And now we make a new edge relation with a formula. Yeah, so we say there is an edge between two vertices X and Y. If the vertex um, X and the vertex Y, they are both blue. And then if the distance in the graph H is two, yeah, exactly connecting via the red vertices here. Yeah, these are exactly the edges that we want to create. And then finally, we want to drop the red edges. Yeah, so we are allowed to take an induced subgraph. And this construction um, is an example of a logical transduction of uh, translating one graph into another or encoding the map graph, the dense graph in a sparse graph. Yeah, so this, this encoding aspect um, is what, what I want to focus on, not so much the how to produce the new image, but uh, to, to encode graphs in other graphs. So in general, uh, logical transductions, we, we want to transform a graph H into a new graph or vice versa, see the, the graph G as interpreted in the graph H and um, encoded with the colors. Um, additionally, in, in general transductions, we are allowed to create a bounded number of copies of this graph H here to begin with. Um, then comes uh, this coloring step that we call in the logical context a monadic lift. Yeah, so we add those unary predicates, the colors to the graph, we get this enriched graph H plus. And then we want to do the interpretation. Yeah, so we have a formula um, and we want to use this formula to define the new edge relation. And by this, we can encode possibly very dense graphs um, in, in sparse graphs, but they are not so much more complicated. Yes, we know um, the skeleton in a sense of, of this graph that we are looking at. Um, we have a pre-image and we can possibly transfer structural results um, from the graph H to the graph G. And this is a lot what this talk is about. Um, yeah, finally, we can take the induced subgraph. Uh, the logics we commonly consider um, are monadic second order logic. This is a very powerful logic. Um, we have quantifiers here over sets of vertices. You see that we can, for example, express the three colorability property of a graph. We will quantify over the colors, um, how we want to color the graph. So we say there exists a red set, a green set, and a blue set. And then we have quantification over the vertices. Um, so we say for every X, um, we want to say now every vertex should get a color. So for every X, um, the vertex should be red or green or blue. Yeah, and we have those uh, unary predicates um, that we can query. Um, and then we need to say that uh, two adjacent vertices do not get uh, the same color. So we say for, X, for all X, for all Y, um, if they both are red, then there must not be an edge. Yeah, so just an example of, of this monadic second order logic. Um, an even richer logic is counting MSO, where we can also do modulo counting on sets. So we can ask, um, is the cardinality of a set that we quantify um, even or odd? And finally, we have the restricted logic first order logic where we can only quantify over elements of the graph. Yeah, for example, we can express the dominating set problem parameterized by the number of dominators. We would say there exist K vertices such that for every vertex, um, either the vertex is among those K or it is adjacent to one of them. Yes, um, you will not need much background about logic. Simply, these are the logics that we are considering. So how is the is this logic connected to the widths measures, uh, clique widths and tree widths? There is a very tight connection. Um, we can characterize those widths measures that I have introduced to you by the, by the tree-like decompositions in terms of those transductions, yeah? translating with logic uh, graphs into other graphs. So a class has bounded shrub depth if and only if it's an MSO transduction of a class of trees of bounded depth. Yes, so from the definition, we actually get this as well, but the, the logical viewpoint on graphs of bounded shrub depths 
is now very clear. Yes, we have the underlying tree and this tree we need to color and then we can reinterpret the, the edges. So from the point of view of the logic, bounded trap depth graphs are just trees of bounded depth. Yeah, and this gives us nice insights from the logic point of view. Um, it is very easy to handle those bounded trap depth graphs accordingly. We also have um, another way of, of saying um, or of characterizing bounded trap depth graph. Yeah, so the one way is to say we come from trees of bounded depth. The other way is to say that we cannot transduce certain things. Yeah, so a class that's bounded trap depth, if and only if, counting MSO cannot transduce all half graphs. You see a half graph here depicted. Um, it's also called a ladder or a, a, a chain graph. Uh, there are many names of this. Equivalently, you cannot transduce a linear order from your class, arbitrary long linear orders. Okay. I will also call those classes CMSO stable classes. If you cannot transduce all half graphs, we will see in a minute why this is the case. And because there is a big theory of, of those half graphs in classical model theory, um, where the stable classes are those uh, where you cannot transduce half graphs uh, with first order logic. Similarly, you can characterize classes of bounded linear liquids as those that are MSO transduction um, transductions of the class of all paths. You can characterize bounded cliquids graphs as those that are MSO transductions of the class of all trees. Yeah? So from the point of view of monadic second order logic, bounded cliquids is not more complicated than simple trees. Yeah? This is quite remarkable. And also here we have the, the dual characterization. Um, a class has bounded cliquids if and only if counting MSO cannot transduce everything, yeah? not all graphs from our class. And I will call these classes CMSO dependent classes, again, because of this connection to model theory. So how can this connection with logic help in an algorithmic context? Let us consider the model checking problem of monadic second order logic. You have seen that we can express, for example, uh, the three colorability problem, which is a very interesting uh, algorithmic problem. And in general, we can ask, can we test efficiently um, if a graph is three colorability, uh, colorable or more general, can we test MSO properties in general on a class of graphs? Now this view um, of, of classes of bounded cliquids, for example, as trees makes it very simple. Yeah? If we have a class of bounded cliquids, it turns out that we can compute both an interpretation, giving us the edge relation, and for every graph from the class, a colored tree, so that applying this interpretation to the, to the tree gives us exactly this graph. Yeah? So we can compute the tree pre-image um, of our seemingly complicated dense graph of bounded liquids. Yeah? But we can translate it into this tree and, and we know how to, to interpret the edges now. And this leads to an efficient model checking algorithm for all MSO definable properties on our class. What we simply have to do, um, we replace the edge relation in our MSO formula by the interpretation formula that we have how to get an edge in the, in the graph G from our tree. Yeah, so we get a more complicated formula, but we are speaking about the tree. And on the tree, we can now do simple dynamic programming um, and evaluate if the formula is true or not. What we get is the famous uh, theorem of Corsell for graphs of bounded tree widths, and then the extension for graphs of bounded click widths by Corsell, Markovsky, and Rotex. Now, unfortunately, this method for MSO is restricted to trees. And the reason is exactly that fact that if we have unbounded click widths, then we can transduce everything with counting MSO. Yeah, so if we have a class with unbounded liquids, then in fact, we can get every graph by transduction. Um, so if you are allowed to put colors on your graph, um, then it may be 
or then you can simply translate the model checking problem from general graphs uh, to your class. Yeah, and this is expected that we cannot do it. So um, by this by this transduction machinery, we, we get that we cannot do model checking uh, beyond classes of uh, bounded click widths. So this is where we stand at this point uh, with the transduction machinery. Um, we have the, the very basic classes of bounded tree depths or the bounded depth trees, if you like. And then with the MSO transduction, um, we are going to the dense versions. Yeah, so tree depths to shrub depths, path widths to linear click widths, and tree widths um, to bounded click widths. And above this, the planar graphs and, and many more, where the model checking uh, problem becomes hard and where counting MSO simply gives us everything. And yeah, so we are limited when we want to use these tools um, to those tree-like structures. So what can we do? We can look at weaker logics, of course. And um, here we, we have a connection with classical model theory, with stability theory. Um, in fact, this is uh, a, an area of classical model theory where it's about the classification of first order theories according to the complexity. And now you see why I named those classes um, monadically dependent or the CMSO dependent classes. So those, uh, those notions are, are very important notions in classical model theory. And here we call a class of graphs monadically dependent. This monadically comes from the coloring process of the transductions. Um, there is a more general notion of uh, dependence and uh, interpretations in, in powers as well. But in our transduction framework, we get the monadically dependent classes as those where we cannot get all graphs by first order transductions. Yeah, so recall that we called a class C MSO dependent um, if we cannot transduce everything. These are exactly the classes of bounded click widths. Yeah, so for C MSO, you know exactly those uh, CMSO dependent classes. Um, for first order logic, um, many people from our community are not yet so uh, familiar with this, with this notion, but see this uh, analogy, yeah, we cannot transduce everything. These are simply called the monadically dependent classes. And then we have the monadically stable, yeah, that are those classes where we cannot get arbitrary large half graphs by first order transductions or equivalently linear um, orders. So in the, in the figure, if we look at this, at, uh, this universe now with, with first order classification, we get a very rich uh, picture above those tree decomposable graphs. Um, we have the planar graphs, graphs with excluded minors, something called bounded expansion, nowhere dense graphs. Then we go with first order transductions, we always get a dense analog of this, um, but with first order transductions, which is weaker than MSO transductions, yeah, we, we cannot transduce everything. So we, we have subclasses here that we try to understand. And then on top, we have the monadically stable and the monadically dependent. And now very recently, there was this new, very exciting width measure of bounded twin width graphs which is sitting here, um, which is an example of a monadically dependent class or of monadically dependent classes. Um, monadically, uh, so bounded twin widths is preserved under first order transduction. If you apply a first order transduction, you will get again a bounded twin widths class um, and not every class has bounded twin widths. So this means we have a monadically dependent class here. Um, bounded twin widths generalizes many well-known graph classes, in particular the notion um, of click widths and the notions of excluding a minor and also of excluding first order transductions of a minor and many, many more. Um, there was in fact a recent characterization um, for, for those bounded twin widths uh, classes in terms of model theory and for audit graphs, we can state it as follows. Every class of ordered graphs has bounded twin widths if and only if the class cannot transduce all graphs with a first order transduction. Yeah, so this is our symbol here, um, this uh, arrow with a 
with the two error heads for a first order transduction, a class has bounded of ordered graphs have bounded twin widths if and only if it's monadically dependent, yeah, in other words. So for ordered graphs, we have it sitting exactly in the top right here. It's the most general class for which it makes sense to look at uh, reasonable questions concerning first order um, properties of the classes. Yeah? If we go for ordered classes beyond bounded twin widths, uh, then we can transduce everything. We cannot expect to get very reasonable results here for first order logic. Yeah, so compare this again to the bounded clique widths characterization, yeah, where we have that a class has bounded clique widths if and only if we cannot get all graphs with CMSO transductions. Yeah, so for ordered graphs, we have exactly this analogy with first order transductions. And then we also have this dual characterization, bounded click widths, are those classes that we can MSO transduce from the trees. And now this talk is about this characterization, somehow a similar characterization for bounded twin widths graphs. Yeah, so we can characterize it already by what we cannot get. And now we want to see from what can we first order transduce classes of bounded twin widths. Do we have something like tree decomposability, like those tree models? Um, this is the question that we are looking at. What is the skeleton sitting um, behind such a bounded twin widths class, such that logic can produce um, the bounded twin widths class um, from this sparse model possibly? Yeah, so what is it that we can expect? Um, also from this theorem here that I put, um, we see that for first order model checking um, on ordered structures, um, we are as good as we can get with bounded twin widths. So Bonnet et al, when they introduced the, method, uh, the measure, they proved also that first order model checking is fixed parameter tractable on every class of bounded twin widths under the assumption that we have a contraction sequence uh, together with the input. So we will see the definition of twin widths in a minute. It is by, uh, by those contraction sequences. So we need an additional input, uh, this contraction sequence for efficient model checking. But for ordered structures, we can compute such contraction sequences efficiently. Yeah, so for ordered structures, we don't need it with the input, we can compute it. So we get um, by this characterization theorem that first order model checking is fixed parameter tractable on classes of ordered structures if and only if uh, the class has bounded twin widths. Yeah, so this whole um, goal of classifying where is first order logic tractable for ordered structures, um, this goal has been achieved. We have uh, the exact characterization um, that we can go to bounded twin widths and not beyond. Okay. So what we are showing in this paper, and I want to give you some ideas on, on how we prove it, is a characterization um, on, on which classes we can uh, transduce bounded twin widths graphs from. Yeah, so we can transduce it, we show from proper permutation classes. Um, these are classes of permutations that are closed under sub-permutations and avoid at least one pattern. So these are not graphs, but rather binary structures where we have a universe and then we represent those uh, permutations via two linear orders. Yeah, so we, you can see it as, as, as the one order giving uh, you an initial ordering and then the second one tells you how do you permute. Yeah? So from proper permutation classes, you can get all the classes of bounded twin widths. And equivalently, what will be most interesting, I, I believe, in the algorithmic context, if you, if you think about this, we provide tree-like decompositions for classes of bounded twin widths, um, and we call those uh, decompositions twin models. So putting this into the context with uh, linear click widths and click widths, about uh, which I have spoken a lot now, we can characterize those classes of bounded linear click widths 
yeah, they in particular have bounded twin widths as exactly those um, that are first order transductions of linear orders. Yeah, so these are exactly the two one avoiding permutations. Yeah, I, I must have both linear orders being equal. I cannot flip any two elements. Then it is just like I had only one. And so I can transduce every class of bounded linear click widths um, exactly from the two one avoiding permutations. For the classes of bounded tree widths, I'm interpreting this from the tree orders in first order logic. Yeah, so the binary tree orders are exactly the two, three, one avoiding permutations. Yeah, so in these terms, I can again characterize exactly the bounded click widths graphs. And then the bounded twin widths graphs are those where there exists just some permutation that I exclude. Yeah, from, from every class, every permutation, proper permutation class, I can transduce um, a class of, of bounded twin widths. Okay. So let's go into the details. Let me first introduce or remind you, if you have seen it already, the notion of twin widths. It is defined by so-called contraction sequences. Let me take just some graph, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and let me throw in some edges. I want to identify similar vertices now. Yeah, um, to make the graph simpler somehow, to partition the graph or to, to iteratively make it simpler. So I'm taking two vertices, A and B, and I, I identify the two or I contract them. Um, so contraction doesn't necessarily require now here that there is an edge between them. So I identify the two vertices, but I want to mark um, that they are not exactly the same vertices or they don't behave in exactly the same way. Yeah, so for example, the vertex B is connected to the vertex D and C and the vertex A is not. Yeah, but both of them are connected to the vertex F. So in this contraction, I'm forming such a contraction sequence now, I, I have this one new vertex now, the other vertices survive. All those uh, edges that were there in the beginning, oh, I, I have one here as well, um, these are not affected. And now A and B towards the vertex F look exactly the same. So in this contraction, I keep this black edge here between this partition now, between the part, while they differ for the vertices D and C. Yeah, so A is not connected to D, while B is connected. So I'm marking that there is a non-uniform connection here. Can you see this well, that this is red? Let me take a lighter red. So I introduce a red edge here, that there is some inhomogeneous uh, part or inhomogeneous connection in this partition. And similarly for the vertex C. Yes, and I continue um, contracting. So let me contract these two vertices. Uh, what I get is the partition AB. I have DC, I have F and I have E. Now this red edge here, this survives, there is the inhomogeneous uh, connection. And I look again um, how, how the connections are. So D is connected to E while C is not. So this is an inhomogeneous connection. And similarly, uh, D is connected to F while C is not. So this is inhomogeneous while this black edge here survives. Um, I continue contracting. Let me contract this one. So I get F, E, A, B, and C, D. And now actually everything becomes inhomogeneous. So the rest of the contraction sequence, all the red edges, um, e and F, A, B, C, D. And then finally, 
we arrive at this one vertex graph. So the red edges mark the arrows or the inhomogeneous uh, connections in, in this contraction sequence. And the twin width of the, the graph is now defined, or the, first the, the twin width of this, this uh, contraction sequence as the maximum red degree that one of these parts has throughout the contraction sequence. Yeah, so this contraction sequence here, um, the worst is this situation where the, where the partition of the, the grouping of the vertices DC, um, this has red degree three. Yeah, so this particular contraction sequence, I'm not claiming that it's particularly good. Um, this has twin with three, and we look now for the best contraction sequence, minimizing the red degree that arises um, in, this, uh, in this sequence. So this is a very simple definition, and it turns out to be remarkably rich and generalize those many classes. It's, it's really nice, a really nice concept. So how can we encode now classes with this property here? Um, and yeah, what do we do with this definition? So we are looking at ways to encode structures with first order logic. Yeah, and one of the key lemmas that we prove is that we, if we have a class of ordered structures that has bounded star chromatic number, this is something strange here, I will introduce it in a minute, um, at most C, so it has bounded star chromatic number, then always we can encode this ordered class nicely in a class of permutations. We have even, so we, we can encode, we can go in the one direction with our ordered class, and we can also go back from the permutation class and reproduce the class. Yeah, so this is what we call a transduction pairing. This is the nicest that we can expect um, from logic if we produce from, from a graph H another structure, and then that we want to come back again to our original structure. Yeah, so whenever we have a class of ordered structures with bounded star chromatic number, then we have such a transduction pairing. So what is it about the star chromatic number? I'm not going to pr prove you this lemma, but a second lemma that will give you ideas on, on how the star chromatic number, what role it plays and why it is important. We have a second uh, key lemma here. This is for general relational structures of also of higher arity. So if we have a class of structures, of relational structures, and their Geifman graphs have star chromatic, have bounded star chromatic numbers, then we can go back and forth with a logical transduction um, between the class of structures and the Geifman graph. So let me tell you what these words mean and why it is something special. So Usually in, in model theory, if we deal with, uh, with relational structures or often in finite model theory, let me say, um, we speak about this Geifman graph. Yeah, so the Geifman graph has the same universe as our structure. And whenever we have a relation um, or a tuple in a relation, so we have U1 to UK in some relation of our signature, then we make a connection between the two vertices. Yeah? So we introduce an undirected edge between the vertices for all the vertices that appear together in a tuple in some relation. Yeah? So somehow we flatten the graph and this is the Geifman graph. And now observe that much information can be lost by this. Yeah, we have this tuple here. The order of the tuple is very relevant. It is U1, U2, up to UK in our k array relation. And if we flatten it, we just get a click on these vertices. And there is no way in general to recover from the Geifman graph by a logical transduction this precise tuple. Yeah, if we have multiple tuples sharing elements, it can be that such cliques are created 
simply because multiple such tuples are, are put together. So we have those cliques, we have uh, some dense parts in our Geifman graph. It still characterizes somehow the, the complexity of, of our uh, relational structure, but much information is lost. Yeah. So it is really a good question. If we flatten a structure, yeah, if we go from the class C to the class of Geifman graphs, how can we come back? How can we encode? And this is now the problem to combinatorially encode somehow to put colors um, onto the Geifman graph so that logic can recover from where we came. And this is where the star chromatic number comes into play. Yeah, we need the structural restriction on the Geifman graph that it has bounded star chromatic number. Otherwise, or this helps us to, to recover the original structure, we proved in an earlier paper that in general, you cannot recover all uh, binary structures. For example, you cannot even um, recover all orientations. So if you have a directed graph, the Geifman graph is obtained by simply forgetting the edge directions. You cannot always recover um, those, those orientations from the Geifman graph. If you have unbounded degree and high girth, for example, it is not possible. And these classes do not have bounded star chromatic number. So what is the star chromatic number? We have our graph. We are coloring the vertices. So we are partitioning them. And we have, say, here a yellow part, here a blue part, here a red part, and some, some dark blue part. And the star chromatic number, um, or a star coloring, first of all, is a coloring so that all two color classes induce a star forest. So if I look only at the light blue and the red, then this must look something like this. This must be a star forest. Yes, we can also have some edges here. But the only looking at this, these two colors yeah, gives, us, gives us a star forest. Looking at two different colors, for example, the light blue and the yellow now can produce further edges. Yeah, but always when we look at only two color classes, then we have a star forest. Okay, so how does this help us to recover from the Geifman graph our original um, structure, our original um, information? So what we have now are the vertices U1, U2, U3, and so on to UK, and they form a clique. So all the information about our tuple seems to be lost. We want to recover that U1 to UK is in one of the relations in our structure. So by our star coloring assumption, we have a star coloring. Yeah, so all two color classes induce a star forest. Let me look at some vertices here. And let's look, for example, at the, at the red vertex. And the neighbors are maybe here light blue. And let's look at a yellow vertex. And again, at the neighbors that are light blue. What we do, we orient all the star centers or all the, all the edges so that they point away from the centers of those stars. Yeah, so for the, for the red, blue, we get the, the star forest. We orient all those edges away. For the yellow, light, blue, we get a star forest. We orient all of these edges away from the centers. Now, if we look at a vertex V, let us look at this vertex here. We conclude that the red in neighbor is the unique vertex that is a red in neighbor. Yeah, there cannot be another red in neighbor. Assume we had this other red in neighbor. Then this would no longer be a star forest. Yeah, so this edge here, this cannot exist. Yeah, so the in neighbors in each color, they are unique. 
Okay. Now we have this click here, yeah, on U1 to UK, and we have oriented all of the edges in some direction. Oh, this is still red. Yeah, let me throw in some arbitrary direction now. Um, I don't know how, how the star coloring actually looks, but we orient, we, by our, by our rule, we have oriented all the edges. So we have a tournament here. And now every tournament by a classical theorem of Rede includes a Hamilton path. Yeah, so I have a path. Let's see how it looks here. I just start here. Uh, I must go up and then I can go here. Yeah, so a path visiting every vertex exactly once. And I'm looking at the last vertex in this Hamilton path. Yeah, so for each tuple from, from my relation, I fix such a Hamilton path on the, um, on the tournament that is induced. And I have the last vertex of the Hamilton path. that exists by the theorem of Rede from 1934. Now I look at the color tuple of my vertices U1 to UK. And I'm claiming that there is exactly one clique with this color tuple that contains the last vertex on this Hamilton path. Why is that the case? Why is there exactly one click with this color pattern? Well, this vertex has a certain color. The in neighbor of this vertex with a different color is unique. Yeah, it is the last on the, on the Hamilton path. So I have this in neighbor. I have this unique vertex of this color. This vertex again has a unique in neighbor of that color. And finally, this vertex has a unique in neighbor. Yeah. So from the color pattern, I know there is only one click on K vertices with exactly this color pattern containing the vertex U3. What do I do? I put the color pattern as a color, as a marking, as a unary, a monadic lift. Yeah, we can encode in colors. I put this color pattern onto the last vertex. And every vertex gets also the color of the, the star coloring. Yes. And from this, my first order formula can now recover the information about the tuple. Yeah. It looks, it, it tests now, is there the tuple you want to UK in the relation? It looks at the, at the colors of the vertices and it can tell, um, yeah, this vertex now has a certain color, the unique neighbor of this vertex, um, and it makes a chain of lengths k. Yeah, um, these vertices belong together uh, into the relation. Yeah. So the star chromatic number can be very nicely used to recover or to encode this information in our, our graph that is flattened and we can recover the structural information. Yeah, so this is the lemma that we proved. Yeah, we have our class um, of structures over a relational signature, arbitrary arity, um, and the Geifman graphs have bounded star chromatic number. Then we can go back and forth between the class and the class um, containing all the Geifman graphs. Okay. So unfortunately, graphs with bounded star chromatic number are sparse. Yeah, so our graphs of bounded twin widths, well, uh, one of the reasons we looked at them and why they are so interesting is that, is that they are very dense. They generalize many dense notions. So we cannot apply directly this lemma. They don't have bounded star chromatic number in general. So this is now where the twin models can, come in. Yeah, we want to encode now the graphs of bounded twin bits in some sparse structure in the first place. Uh, 
paste. This is what we had, our contraction sequence. From this, I want to construct now a twin model and a twin model will be a sparse representation of, of our graph. And in fact, it will be a tree-like model, yeah, but there are those red edges I must somehow uh, encode, encode those red edges, and this will be different. It must be different from, from the definition of clique width, uh, where we had exactly the tree encodings. So what do we have? I don't want to interpret now this contraction sequence as an identification sequence of, of near twins or yeah, of similar vertices. I want to take a look from the other point of view as partitioning the graph yeah, of decomposing it recursively into parts in a tree-like way. So I'm starting with this very last vertex and what's happening, I'm partitioning the graph into two parts. So I'm building a tree. I have the part A, B, C, D on this side. And I have on the other side, um, this E and F. Yeah. Then A, B, C, D is split in the next step into A, B and C, D. And then we are splitting E and F. And now something happens. This is the first time, if we look at the contraction sequence from the other side, that a black edge appears. Yeah. So now there is a homogeneous connection between the vertex F and the part AB. So I'm now marking this. Yeah, I'm making an edge in my twin model between A, B and the, the part F. Yeah, so I don't have this, this nice tree alone, but I need also some edges encoding what's going on between the parts. Um, and I introduce such a blue edge whenever for the first time I have a black edge. So this uh, homogeneous interaction between the parts. Yeah? So how does the contraction sequence go on? Um, I'm splitting now C and D, C and D, and I'm introducing new black edges between D and F. And also between D and E. Yes, and I do the, the final split between A and B. And again, I'm introducing some new blue edges. Um, between B and D and between B and C. Yes, so this is my twin model. It is a tree-like decomposition of my graph, but I have those transversal edges. Yes, this we prove is a, is a degenerate graph that we get here, this encoding. And from this, we conclude, it is known that if you have a class of bounded twin widths, um, that is sparse, then you have a bounded expansion class and bounded expansion classes have bounded star chromatic number. So we can now deal with this object, with this sparse object representing our graph of bounded twin widths. Um, we can recover the edges. And uh, a good question now is, uh, can you draw just any tree and draw, throw in uh, those blue edges and you will get a graph of bounded twin widths? And obviously this shouldn't be the case. Yes, they must be somehow well behaved. Um, so we, we looked at the twin models and, and characterized exactly what trees with the transversal edges you will, uh, you will need to, to have bounded twin widths. Let me put this here. And let me put a second copy. So the twin models formally are defined for binary relational structures. We can uh, have multiple relations. Yeah, so we, we have our universe A, and then we have the binary relations R1 to Rk. And then we encode this in a rooted binary tree. And then we have those transversal edges. So these are more binary relations. Uh, for every relation that you want to encode, you have 
so these, uh, these exceptional pairs or those transversal pairs that tell you when is um, a homogeneous connection made. And now we want two conditions on the twin models. And whenever we have those two conditions, then it will be able, we will be able to recover a contraction sequence and really to encode a graph of bounded twin widths. So one, we have a minimality condition. Yeah, so if we have such a transversal edge, then we don't want a higher transversal edge that actually subsumes this already. Yeah, this makes sense. If we look at the twin model um, and we have such a blue edge here, we don't want an edge like this. Yeah, this would already be doing the job telling us that the connections between A, B, C, D and E, F are homogeneous. So we don't have to tell this at a later point. Yeah, so we have this minimality condition. Now, the second condition is a consistency condition that looks a little bit strange at the first place. If you think about the minimality and if you think about um, if you want to just cover all the biclicks in your graph, all the homogeneous parts, then look at this, at these two edges here. Yeah? They tell us that B is homogeneously connected with C and with D. So with all the vertices that appear already here, yeah? so doesn't it make sense to not encode these edges here or tell B are connected to C and D. Can we not tell it already earlier that there is this homogeneous connection here? And similarly, for these two here, yeah, we have D connected to E and F. Why didn't we make this connection here? Yeah, so let's try to do this. Yeah, D could be connected like this. But now we have a problem. Try to, to build a contraction sequence now. Yeah, so AB wants to connect to F. So this requires that we have split this part. Yeah. D wants to connect to E and F. Yeah. So if we split this part, we need that also this splitting has been, has been happening before. Yeah. So this must have been split already. But CD wants to connect also in a homogeneous way to this. So this splitting also has to have happened. Yeah. So we have a problem here. We cannot tell which of these three splittings should be done first. Yeah. We cannot get a contraction sequence. There is some inconsistency in this model. Yeah. And what we observe is that there is a, a cycle in this model that doesn't use two blue vertices, con, uh, two blue edges consecutively. And this is exactly the consistency condition that we need to put additionally into this, uh, into this definition of twin models. If we have a directed cycle um, in our model, yeah, with the with the black edges pointing away from the root and using the, um, those uh, blue edges um, accordingly so that we get a cycle, then we must contain two consecutive blue such edges. And then we will have consistency. This will allow us to recover our, our graph. Um, the, the leaves of our twin model are the vertices of the structure. And then we can simply look up, is there um, a tuple in the relation? Um, we look, are there higher vertices so that we have this blue edge, which tells us homogeneous connectivity. So we derive from this um, the connection. And this consistency and minimality will ensure us that we can give a numbering um, to the vertices in which order we shall, uh, shall do the, the partitioning. Um, and then we can define from this the width of a twin model, and we get um, yeah, uh, an alternative characterization of, of twin widths in terms of those twin models of bounded widths. Um, they have bounded star chromatic number, and then we can do all our encoding business here. So there are multiple reductions involved. Um, our main result again here, we have a class of bounded twin widths, if and only if we can first order transduce it from a proper permutation class, 
and if and only if we have those twin models of bounded widths. What I have shown you is uh, this part of the proof. Um, so this year is our ordered tree model. This year is the Geifman graph or the ordered Geifman graph, um, how to um, recover from, from Geifman graphs um, our, our twin models or our, our structures in general, yes. So all of these are transduction pairings um, and this is quite some technical work, but I, I think I have shown you some of the nice combinatorial ideas that we apply here to encode uh, one structure in another to recover information um, to, to show you this uh, nice connection of logic with, with structural graph theory. Maybe you can use the twin models uh, for some of your algorithmic applications. Um, decomposability in, in a tree-like way, in this recursive way, is always a very nice thing for dynamic algorithms. Um, well, the, those uh, ideas were in fact used, of course, for the model checking uh, results, this dynamic programming. Um, so let me put this here again in the context um, of, of tree decomposable graphs that, that you may know. Um, those uh, proper permutation classes, yeah, the, the patterns that, that are avoided for the linear click widths, the two one avoiding permutations and code linear click widths, two three one avoiding permutations and code click widths, and then excluding any permutation um, gives us exactly the bounded twin widths graphs. And this naturally leads um, to some to a conjecture. Um, and with this, I want to conclude that every hereditary class of ordered graphs, um, is it transduction, first order transduction equivalent to some permutation class? So thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Sebastian, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, now I leave the place open for people to ask questions. Just unmute yourself and ask question to Sebastian directly. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, thanks, thanks for the very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. so, so to get to get the equivalence with the bound, for example, bounded linear click width and the mm -hmm. permutation class avoiding two one. So you so did you actually follow all these chain of transductions or like do you have some more intuitive explanation? Okay, so for example, bounded click width. Why? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you obtained with this particular pattern that. The permutation class of voice. So, how do you have some more intuitive explanation why it should be the case? So, this is not our result. Yes, uh -huh. it, it is this classical result um, by, I think, by Thomas Colcombe um, that you can first order transduce uh, bounded click widths classes in tree orders and, in fact, in binary tree orders. Yeah. So, the two, three, one avoiding permutations are exactly the binary tree orders. Yeah, so this is just in this language that I introduced, um, the characterization of, of bounded click widths. Um, this uh, result, uh, yeah, we didn't prove this result, this characterization of bounded click widths. Um, it has then the combinatorics for bounded click widths um, by Simon's factorization theorem. It goes actually of how to decompose uh, classes of bounded click widths so that first order logic um, can reinterpret or can find all the edges that are actually there. Yeah, so this, this is an, another uh, non trivial result, a non trivial characterization. Um, if you think about um, the monadic second order logic, it's a lot clearer. Um, how you how you can discover your uh, um, your graph from a tree, yeah? Because you you can very clearly tell um, you can put colors on the vertices and then put recolorings on the the edges if you like or on the parents of the vertices, um, and click widths can then be defined um, by such a sequence of uh, 
of recolorings and connecting vertices of certain color in the parents or in the ancestors um, where the two branches of the tree meet. Yeah, so um, you, you have a click expression that tells you um, when two vertices meet in this, in a, in, a, uh, in an ancestor of the click expression, which vertices to connect. And monadic second order logic can quite directly decode this. And for first order logic, this is quite some work to do it. Yeah. But thinking about the click expressions gives you this quite directly for the uh, for click widths. Okay. Yeah. So 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 you you can already tell it from that um, bounded click with is MSO equivalent with the tree order. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but for first order logic, you always need the the order. Yeah. So MSO doesn't need the order. Um, it can find the least common ancestor of two vertices. Um, with a monadic uh, quantification. First order logic needs the order to tell this. Yeah, so this is why you need the, the three orders to, to recover uh, with first order logic, your bounded click width graph. Right. Mm -hmm. And also in our twin models, um, so you will see here that we are at this point, uh, we are working with ordered or full twin models um, where an order is, is still available. Yeah, so we need this order to be able to tell with first order logic, uh, what is the least common ancestor or even to look up, is there a tuple now? Yeah, we need to find um, two ancestors of the vertices and then check, is there a blue edge? Yeah, and first order logic always needs this, uh, this order available um, to tell what are actually the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? Let's wait for a minute. Maybe someone has a question. Mm -hmm. else. Yeah, so there's a question by Jungo. What about bounded Mimbeth? Uh, that is a good question. Um, so graphs of bounded Mim widths do not have bounded uh, twin widths as far as I know. Um, so they do have those tree like decompositions if you plug in the right connectivity function for this. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe someone from the audience can help me. I, I think bounded MIM width graphs do not have bounded twin widths. So you will not have um, these models. Internal graphs is bounded MIM width. Okay. And does internal graph has, yes, correct. That's true. Mm -hmm. And unbounded twin widths. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. So bounded mim widths does not imply bounded twin width, so the models uh, will look differently um, if you like to, to construct something for bounded mim widths. Let's see, anybody else has any question? Um, okay, so maybe a little live question. I, I am, I'm not even sure whether this question would make sense or not. So, um, so for this um, FOE equivalence, so, so you, you prove this FOE equivalence so for ordered structures, right? Um, actually, for all structures, yes, the order is, is required to encode things, yes, but. Um, so we start with, with an arbitrary class of, of bounded twin bits, and we can encode it in a proper permutation class. If you like to have this, this uh, transduction pairing, you see all the pairings are here. For the pairings, we need the order, yes? But if you like to get your class, um, this is what we are saying, yes, it's an FO transduction of a proper permutation class. You need to follow the arrows in this direction. So from the permutation class, you get um, your class of bounded twin widths. You can encode it um, no matter if you have an order or not um, in the proper permutation class. Right. Okay. Right. So, ah, okay. So, so the, the, the bottom leftmost one is on ordered one. And exactly. And from this, we cannot go to the permutations 
purely with first order logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we need to follow this chain constructing this uh, twin model, um, but this must be somehow given we need an, an order. Um, yeah, we need to find this order, this contraction sequence. Yeah, so so by by equipping the bottom left uh, structure with a tree, twin model, you are you are providing additional order order relation. Yes. yes. Um, mm -hmm. And this order that we need is not first order definable. Yeah. So we or we don't know if it is. Um, no, it cannot be. Um, you yes. cannot construct. Uh, long orders for example yeah it will if you if you start from something sparse you will never be able to create a long order yeah? so want... this cannot be by first order logic uh, this must be done by hand in a in a sense so so if you don't if you use, use ms or one logic then can you like, is there some part which becomes easier or it doesn't make sense? In this that is a very interesting question. And we are actually uh, trying to, to solve this, even for bounded clique widths. It is an, an open question and a very interesting question that we are looking at. If you can define the clique expressions um, from the class of bounded clique widths. So for bounded linear clique widths, um, in fact, this is uh, a quite, quite recent result for tree widths um, that you can define tree decompositions in, in monadic second order logic. Um, and for bounded linear clique widths, it's also known. Mm -hmm. And for bounded clique widths, we are, we are trying to define them, um, those, those clique decompositions. And for bounded uh, twin widths, it's, it's also a good question if, um, if those twin models are MSO definable. All right. Okay. They are definitely not first order, or you cannot define a, a long order from something where order is not present. Yeah. Um, so, so you cannot get um, the good permutation, for example, for this. Maybe you could get a, a good twin model, but um, yeah, in general, you will need something more powerful. Right. So, so you're suggesting that so maybe it's possible from to go from C to F. Uh, with MSO or with C MSO transduction mm -hmm. to possibly for bound for, for bounded uh, okay for click expression and maybe for also twin model immediately without yes mm -hmm. so this is something that we are looking at but uh, which is non obvious that it how it how it works okay thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I think it's already 10 minutes past the ending time. So let's thank Sebastian for such a wonderful thank, uh, talk. And thanks a lot to all of you for turning up for the talk. So see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Sebastian. And here's a clap for me. Bye -bye. Physical clap. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you.